So I welcome you all to this webinar on uh, reporting the rising Rift Valley Lakes. My name is Kyoko Wakibandi. I am a journalist and a journalism trainer at Egerton University. I have uh, reported on uh, quite a number of topics, but mainly around uh, democracy and governance and health. Then uh, around 2015, I came to like the topic of climate change reporting. And um, I fell in love with it. And uh, the rest, as they say, is, uh, is history. So the 2020 State of Climate in uh, Africa report by the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, is out. And it paints a very gloomy picture about the extent of climate change in the continent. Among the key highlights of the report is the fact that the last 30 years, actually 1991 to 2020, uh, Africa has had the highest warming trends as well as the highest rainfall level ever witnessed in history. And uh, part of the areas where these uh, high rainfall patterns have been witnessed is actually the Rift Valley region, which is what we will be discussing today. The report also paints, um, points out uh, very severe consequences in the days to come, some of which are already being witnessed. We have displacements due to climate change, we have loss of diversity, we have food security, we have conflicts and so on and so forth. I actually also learned from the report that even the locust invasion that uh, we had in some parts uh, of the Eastern Africa was actually caused by climate change. The report says that uh, the pre prevailing climatic conditions favored not only the reproduction of the locust, but also their movement because of uh, wind direction and uh, such like things. So that's not all. The report actually tells us that we need to be very careful because uh, in Africa, we are losing our mountain glaciers. And uh, in Kenya, uh, we are being told that uh, if we are not careful in the next 10 years, we are going to lose the glacier that we have on Mount Kenya. These are very serious consequences that we follow if we don't take mitigation measures on climate change. But we are not here to scare anyone. We're just uh, holding this webinar so that then we can see how or, or look for best ways to ignite uh, thoughts on how each one of us can continue playing a role in pushing forward the climate change uh, narrative, either in preventing or uh, in mitigation. So in the next one hour or third minutes or so, we are going to interact with specialists in trying to understand how journalists can add flavor to the climate change conversation in our country, uh, in our county, country, continent, and uh, the world at large. We have the following. We have Professor Bocklin Bebe, who is a Deputy Vice Chancellor Research Division Egerton University. Um, he will be telling us the role of research and extension in combating climate change. We have James Fan, who is an executive director at Journalism Network, uh, who will give us uh, a talk on uh, internews, uh, resources, opportunities, and how to report on COP26. He will be joining us later, though, in the course of the webinar. We also have Professor Gilbert Oboyere who is an Associate Professor of Landscape Ecology and Ecosystem at Egerton University. He'll be talking to us on understanding the facts on the rising Rift Valley lakes phenomenon. Then we have Dr. Tekla Mutia, who is an Environment and Natural Resource Scientist at Geothermal Development Company here in Kenya. She'll be talking about the nexus between climate change and natural resource degradation with a case of uh, the rising lakes uh, phenomenon. And we have Bridget Singana, who's one of us, uh, a regional reporter with NTV uh, here in Kenya. And she will be sharing with us because she's one of the journalists who have actually told this story. She will be talking to us on how to tell the climate change story, right? So um, just to tell you that uh, our initial target for the webinar was uh, professional, 15 professional journalists from the Rift Valley Lex region, as well as 15 journalism students from Egerton University, both undergraduate and postgraduate. And uh, they're actually accompanied by their lecturers. But we also have other journalists from uh, different regions, as well as uh, 
uh, some people who are climate change enthusiasts and um, they are also with us to be with us with in, uh, in this uh, deliberation. Uh, I will be inviting Kyundo Waweru, the project manager, wildlife and conservation media coverage East Africa at Internews to give us his remarks. But uh, before, um, and, and um, after we hear from him, we will hear from uh, Brooklyn Bebe. But uh, let me just inform you that in case you have any question, kindly post it in our question and answer feature on the webinar, okay? That's the question and answer feature on the webinar. But again, don't forget to join our network by registering on our website, which is earthjournalism.net. You should find this link in the email we sent all of you. By registering, you will receive news about webinars like this, as well as other events. And uh, let me also just confirm to you that a recording of this webinar will be available on the website almost immediately after this. So over to you, Kiundo. And once we hear from you, we shall hear from Professor Boklin Bebe. Asante. Thank you so much, uh, Kiyoko, for that wonderful introduction and for giving me this opportunity. Mine will be a few minutes. Uh, I don't even mentioned about uh, the director of internews, earthjournalism.net, who'll be doing a presentation and I'm sure he'll talk about internews and who we are. Uh, and I know most of the you know, reporters that are tuned in I know who internews are. Uh, internews basically is uh, a media development organization. Uh, we in over 100 countries uh, where we empower you know, local media with information that they need uh, to be able to reach uh, larger audiences. Um, Earthjournalism.net is a program uh, of, um, of internews. I would say like it's environment arm. Um, and we are also in these many countries, over 100 countries, just trying to improve uh, the quality and the quantity of environmental and conservation coverage uh, of those issues in our media in all these countries. Uh, so we have a component of EJN uh, East Africa uh, that I lead, uh, which basically started in 2019. And the work we were doing were training workshops, uh, giving stories, stipends, but on conservation and uh, environment. Uh, but now, uh, this year, uh, we're happy for the next two years, uh, for the next one year, we'll have a focus of conservation and environment and a bit of climate change. And uh, uh, to tell the story of climate change, as Kyoko had said, it's, it's a story that needs to be told and it's a complex story uh, to the media. Uh, so it's very uh, important uh, for us to be able to partner uh, with the people who do this every day uh, so that they are able to break the jargon, to break the, jargon um, the, the, the technicality of climate change uh, so that we are able to report the story better. And we're very grateful uh, that today uh, we are joined you know, by experts and lecturers, scientists uh, from Egerton University, and also Dr. Tekla Mutia will tell us about herself. She's studied at, at, um, at Egerton and went on to do you know, great things elsewhere. Uh, so Kyoko, uh, mine was just to give that background to say that uh, uh, these uh, we've done this in collaboration with the Gator University as Internews Earth Journalism Net, and I'll be coming at the tail end to talk about a few opportunities that we have that everyone can apply for uh, in the coming uh, few days or months. Uh, back to you, Kiyoko, and all the best with the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Kyundo. Uh, so now, without wasting uh, time, let's hear from uh, Professor uh, Boklin Bebe, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research Division at Egerton University. And uh, he can also take that opportunity to tell us just briefly about uh, the Division of Research at Egerton University. And then we move on to his presentation. Karibu, Professor. Uh, thank you, Kyoko. Thank you, the Internews, uh, for this opportunity to engage with you on. Uh, matters climate change, specific, specifically the rising uh, river levels and uh, the lake levels. Uh. Uh, my name has been uh, indicated to you. My name is Brooklyn Bebe. Myself, I'm animal scientist, but uh, currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Extension of Egerton University. Uh, Egerton 
that uh, is a subject of this uh, session. I think four of them, starting from Naivasha, Lamentaita, Nakuru, Bogori, and Baringo, they are all within, I think, 60 kilometers. So we are at the heart of it, of this case. Uh, at Ijaton, we have made a strategic decision to have a division that is dedicated to research and extension, which I'm heading. Uh, this division is mandated to manage our research portfolios. And currently we are managing research portfolios in excess of 100, close to 3 billion Kenya shillings in the total budget worth from different uh, uh, groups, different partnerships all over the world. Uh, research and extension division is also mandated or charged with the uh, coordinating extension and outreach engagements. Mostly we do this within the, within the country uh, with, in partnership with many other organizations, NGOs, county and the national government. We also in charge of the consultancy, we do this for those who require our services, which is diverse, running from agricultural, health, environment, law, we have a pool of experts uh, within our university to deliver for you consultancy services in areas that you require advice. Uh, at the research and extension division, we are also implementing the vision 2030 flagships that are assigned to us by the government. Uh, this includes the agroscience park, the botanic garden, and also restoration of the Njoru River. This is in the Mao ecosystem. So these are uh, some of the things that we do that uh, the research and extension division falls. So in this talk, I've been invited to talk to you about the role of research and extension uh, division, or rather uh, the role of research and extension in combating uh, climate change. Uh, I want to share with you a slide to be able to focus on the areas that uh, the, uh, on my message. So whoever allow me to, to share, am I allowed to share? Please allow me to share. Yes. Have you tried? Uh, I think it's open. Do you see it? I know. Do you no. see it? Yeah, it's coming. Uh, do you have it? Um, I think it should be up in a sec. Check it. Yeah, there we go. You have it, eh? Yes, thank you. Yes. So for my talk, I want to focus on answering four questions. The first three questions, I use them to prepare to eventually come to the last. In the first question, I want to answer what is climate change in a way that all of us understand it. And then I'll try to explain why then we need to combat that climate change and how to combat that climate change uh, this then will inform, I will talk to you on the role of research and extension in combating uh, climate change. Uh, I think it would be best or more understood if you look at climate change as what you observe. Changes that you observe in climate and weather patterns. And the things that we see that we can relate to climate change majorly is rising temperatures. We're already estimating that we're already having over 100, uh, one degree rise, which uh, I show in this from work that uh, already scientists have developed. And consequent to this, 
ice is melting, glaciers are melting, melting in Kenya and everywhere else, North Pole, bring you closer here to East Africa. We use Kilimanjaro, just in seven years, we are losing a lot of ice. And you see now it's becoming bare just in seven years. If this continues, we are heading to dangerous floods that is destroying our homes, our schools, even infrastructure. Business is not spared. Down to the, to the extreme right is a business resort in Baringo, already merged in water. All this come with a price. Severe droughts later follow, which destroys our food, our animals and crops. So we experience food loss. If we communicate this, we understand climate change closer to something that we need to be thinking about, we need to be working about. Why do we have to combat climate change? We want to avert, actually we want to avert crises that come with climate change. Depending on the magnitude, it could be stress, shocks, threats, hazard risks, and disaster. Climate change comes with disaster and crisis, and this is what we have to avert. Disasters, crisis, risks that are induced by climate change affect our people, us, our community, our ecosystems and biodiversity, our food systems, economy, even infrastructure and health systems are not spared. And you can keep mentioning others. We want, by combating climate change, we want to curtail this or bring them to manageable level to live with, the, with them. A, how do we combat climate change? There are two approaches, if we summarize it. There are those that are pathway of the, the there's all that are adaptation actions, but there are those that are mitigation actions. For adaptation, these are actions, if you implement, will help us reduce our vulnerability and our exposure to all these threats and disasters and crises that are induced by climate change. Adaptation also includes actions that may beneficially exploit values or economic otherwise that may come with these crises or the In this conference, Professor has muted. Am I muted now? You hear me? You're, you're okay now. You're okay. You're okay. Great. As I was saying in this COP26 in Glasgow, 190 leaders are expected. And one agenda that they want to commit to is limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees by 2050. What they mean here, that all actions thereof 
will be towards producing less carbon and removing more carbon to give us net zero carbon. And each country is expected to make an obligation setting a target which they will be reporting to the UN, which they will be reporting to the UN. Uh, my, sorry, my slides. Your slide is still on, Prof. Yes. It's okay. Uh, so, on uh, commitments that each country will make, we are calling them national determined contributions so that this becomes a global commitment to reduce emissions. So if we look at mitigation actions, adaptation actions, there are conditions for their success if you are to apply them to help us curtail the shocks, to help us curtail the disasters, the crisis that the climate change brings. We require to updating information about climate change, when it is coming, what magnitude, when will it, where, where, where will it. We need to have managerial capacities. We must develop technological capacities that will help us respond or manage or predict and study it. We need supportive policies, but also some will require that we change our behaviors. Those behaviors that will help reduce especially the emissions. For us to get these requirements, one thing we require most is scientific evidence-based scientific evidence solutions. That will come from research. That scientific evidence-based solution, once developed by research, must be communicated to the society, to the end users, to build climate literate society who are able to use that scientific evidence as solutions to the climate change threats. So adaptation actions, mitigation actions, then for it to be effective comes in the role of research and extension for which I want to talk to you or you invited me to talk to you about. Eh? So this brings us to the role of research and extension in combating climate change. Research is to provide scientific evidence. Scientific evidence that should inform our decision-making. Help us choose which adaptation, which mitigation actions we use. We expect that that scientific evidence we should be reliable knowledge. It will be reliable, or it should be reliable, if our decision will be relevant. Eh? So research has a role to play in providing solutions that we apply to this curtailing the threats or disasters or crisis, depending on the magnitude. We are relying on research to design and develop or validate tools we use, practices we apply, technologies and innovations that will enable Is, uh... There was do adaptations okay. and mitigate that the science has given us, that the research has given us. Eh? So extension will be able to help us scale those scientific evidence. They do this through education and building capacity so that it builds climate literacy in our society. It is a feedback, there is it. It provides a feedback to research on which solutions have worked, which solutions have not worked, so that the research can further refine and 
make the solutions that will work for circumstances you may find ourselves dealing with these climate-induced uh, challenges. Research, therefore, should be able to anticipate, help us anticipate and respond to those threats. When do you anticipate it? How should we respond? We need that information that will inform us how best to adapt, how best to mitigate, where do we do the investment and finance? that will go towards adaptation and mitigations. We support the policies will be best if applied to enable the society, different countries, all those vulnerable to be able to apply relevant mitigations, relevant adaptations. We want to rely on extension to build the capacity to be able to apply those solutions effectively and appropriately. So deploying those solutions to scale is what extension does through programming or even mobilizing uh, financing or engaging different uh, groups. It is playing brokering role in the implementation of the actions, be it adaptation or mitigations. And I see the media role as playing extension role, communicating this information, communicating what climate change is, communicating what solutions are for different groups, for different people with different, under different uh, circumstances. So I want to share with you one impact of research from a study in Ethiopia, where for smaller farmers, just receiving one extension of visit reduces the likelihood of remaining poor by 10%. That's extension. By just receiving one extension visit, engaging you in talk and all those advice, helps these smaller farmers to increase consumption of this knowledge, of this technology, of these innovations by up 7%. That's the power of extension. Uh, so as we see it, the, go, the, the COP26, has made commitments and the commitments are about mitigation and adaptation to scale. One of their goal is to secure global net zero mid uh, net, net zero by mid uh, century, actually by 2030 and to keep the goal of uh, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees within reach. The other goal is to help us protect communities and our habitats, mobilize resources and work together. All these goals will only be achieved if we have the right engine and the right engine must be that of research, that of extension and that of education. This is the most relevant for sustaining our actions that will help us to mitigate and to adapt to challenges that will come with climate change induced uh, conditions. So this is what I want to share with you. And uh, remember the engine to mitigation, to adaptation will remain research, extension and education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bocklin Bebe, uh, DVC Research, uh, DVC Research and Extension at uh, Ijatron University on that uh, talk about the relationship between research and uh, or the role that uh, research plays in combating climate change. I want us now to move on to Professor Gilbert Oboere, who will now give us the science behind the rising lakes uh, phenomenon. Professor Gilbert Oboere. And uh, as he gets ready, let me keep reminding you that if you have any question, kindly put it in the Q&A feature. It's down there at uh, the Zoom. Uh, at the Zoom, kindly put any question you have there. And for any other information, kindly put it at the chat and keep registering, uh, kindly keep registering. 
uh, someone asking here whether we can get Professor Bebe's presentation via mail. We will organize for that. For now, let's hear from Professor Gilbert Oboere. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kiyoko, for the introduction. Uh, maybe I'll say one or two things about myself before uh, I quickly just take you through uh, some synopsis about the rising levels of uh, the Rift Valley Lakes. Uh, I'm an associate professor of landscape ecology and ecosystem health at the Department of Natural Resources. I've served as a chairman of Department of Natural Resources for six years, dean faculty of environment and resources development for four years, and currently I'm the director of examinations and timetabling at Egerton University. Uh, I think uh, uh, for the sake of time, uh, I want to say something about uh, the rising uh, lakes, uh, level lakes. Uh, one is that uh, the recent changes indicate an increase of about 21% uh, in, uh, for example, Lake Naivasha and about 123% in Lake Solai. That is uh, quite substantial. And uh, the minimum, uh, uh, minimum and maximum uh, changes are between 8.53 meters and 2.38 meters recorded within the last 50 years. And uh, scientists have tried to explain this phenomenon and uh, a bit of it uh, is mythological. Uh, the, right, the people in the uh, communities around, some of them think that uh, it is uh, uh, something wrong with the gods. It's acceptable, it's a sociological aspect. The gods are not happy with what we are doing, uh, maybe related to climate issues, uh, because degradation is not uh, something that is happy with nature. And therefore, you'll find uh some people explaining uh, especially the sociologists may be explaining the rising levels in a sociological manner in a cultural way but in science uh two issues come to play and this is hydroclimatic conditions and geomorphological changes uh, under hydroclimatic conditions we are looking at uh, catchment response and changes in climatic conditions. And uh, these are likely to cause uh, imbalances in the water cycle. And then we'll see a net effect of either rises in uh, water levels or reduction in water levels, depending on the uh, weather or climatic phenomena, especially evapotranspiration and rainfall amounts. So geomorphologically, uh, we are looking at uh, tectonic plate uh, issues. We are in the Great Rift Valley region where uh, this is an active uh, volcanic region and uh, there are bound to be also tectonic uh, issues. Now, how do we explain uh, the rising le uh, uh, levels in uh, the Rift Valley lakes. Actually, uh, an integrated catchment response uh, scenario or uh, model relates lake volumes to the water balance. And the water balance has several uh, uh, factors. There are factors related to the catchment and factors related to climate. So the amount of uh, water that we'll be seeing going into the rivers and then finally into lakes will be a function of the soil characteristics and the water characteristics or the rainfall characteristics. So this can be explained in this integrated uh, catchment response model. And the integrated catchment response model indicates uh, that 
very minimum changes in water balance can explain the phenomenon uh, increase in lake level rises. So if we have a, a very small change, for example, in infiltration rates, it means that over the catchment, the water will run off and end up in the lakes. And therefore, we are likely to have uh, a phenomenal change in uh, lake levels. Now, as we continue, we are seeing that the integrated catchment response has components re uh, related to uh, the landscape. And in this uh, landscape, there will be two important components of what is happening in the landscape. One of them is the natural phenomena, which includes the plate tectonics, the climatic theories, and the hydrologic theory. So if there are changes in plate tectonics, if there are changes in climatic uh, conditions, and if there are changes in the hydrology of the catchment, then we are likely to have changes in water levels in the, le in the rivers and finally in the lakes. And number two, at landscape level, we have anthropogenic activities or human activities. They are also responsible for the changes we are seeing in the catchment. Uh, as uh, my DVC has just uh, explained, you'll find that as we look at climates and climate change, it is both a natural phenomenon and a human-induced phenomenon. There are, there are issues that are uh, happening in our landscapes because of the natural cycles. And there are also issues that are happening in the environment or in the landscape that are man-made. So we are looking at two very uh, uh, synchronized uh, systems. One of the systems will act, uh, definitely affect the other. And this uh, must be researched and we get the correct data and statistics that will be able to inform the decisions that we are going to take in case the rises or the changes in the environment become of significant uh, levels that will impact negatively on livelihoods, on uh, finance and economics, or the economy, and on the general universal uh, uh, environment. Because as we, we know today, uh, the environment, the world is a very small village. The actions we do in one area will definitely affect the global scenario. So uh, after looking at all these scenarios, we can now be able to understand what causes the levels of water to rise in the lakes. But then, how are we supposed to report? I think uh, overly we have been having a situation where we find uh, statements that are very general, that the water level uh, is rising in Lake uh, Nakuru, for example, because of climate change. I think that would be uh, to us in uh, climate science and uh, in the environment, that would be overly a general statement. Because if we were to look for solutions, then how do we start or where do we start? Then we need to report on specific climatic attributes that actually impact on levels of water in the lakes. For example, can we be able to show the, let me just put on my lights. Sorry for that, uh, it was getting dark. I'm in a place where it's raining heavily right now. Uh, uh, I was saying, can we specifically report rather than making uh, general statements. Like when you say climate change is responsible for uh, the rising levels in, uh, 
in the Rift Valley Lakes. What aspect of climate is it? Because there are so many factors of climate. Rainfall, temperature, humidity, winds, all that. But there could be only one aspect that is actually uh, leading to what we are seeing. But it is not maybe only rainfall, but the catchment uh, characteristics. If there is degradation in the catchment and we have high rainfall, we are likely to have more runoff with less infiltration. And therefore, the water will run and gush into the lakes. And as it goes, it goes with the sediments. The levels of water might rise, but the depth of the lake is reducing. So we are seeing water uh, coming up from above the levels that are normal, but actually the depth of the lakes has also reduced. So we need to be very careful when we are actually passing on scientific information for use by the community. Because remember, it is the media that is responsible for the extension, especially communication of scientific information. It has to be broken down to what the farmers, the common uh, manaiti can be able to use. And that is why uh, my DVC also mentioned this uh, already and say that the media will be able to uh, try to put, uh, join the, the dots between research and utility of the research findings. So I think uh, the most important thing now is to see how to link the media and research in trying to get the right information that has been uh, uh, based on uh, scientific research so that it can be packaged in the right manner to be useful for solving uh, the climate change issues or even what we are observing in the lakes. Uh, if you look at uh, Lake Bogoria, for example, uh, there are people who will only read in history if this scenario continues about the geysers and hot springs. Now, if you you are in Bogoria in 1993 or 92 or 90 or even in the early 2000, you could go there and uh, boil an egg. But today, I don't think you can even see the geysers themselves. This has impacted negatively on the economy of Bogoria. Because most of our, our tourists came to see the geysers. Now, this is a point where we can be able to uh, engage the media and report positively about any other opportunities that may have arise, a reason or another reason from the condition that we are in, rather than um, uh, putting a lot of emphasis on the negative aspects. Even climate change has positive aspects. There are people who are making use of the, positive, the, the changes in climate to uh, produce more food. There are places where we are going to have more food and less uh, impact. So we need to look for solutions uh, along those lines. And then, uh, uh, as I said, for media, I know uh, it is not news that a dog has beaten a man, but it is news that uh, a man has beaten a dog. So uh, I think uh, we, we, when it comes to serious matters like uh, climate, uh, let's report and report accurately so that we are not just wanting people to listen to what we want to say, but rather to help them get solutions to their problem. There are issues that you can play around with, but not natural issues like climate change and uh, natural phenomena like uh, rising rift valley lakes, levels of rift valley lakes. So I would uh, want to stop there, and uh, maybe if there will be any questions, I'll be able to answer. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Professor so much for, uh, your... No, it's it's okay. Actually, at some point we had gotten concerned because your video was not very clear until you put on the lights. 
but now we are able to see you very well. Thank you for um, starting already to ignite the discussion towards asking about the new opportunities on climate change and concerns on accurate reporting. And uh, also as you are starting that issue of even the mythology around uh, climate change, we have invited um, communication students, like I said, and they are on board with their lecturers and our communication program here is hosted under the Department of Literature, Languages and Linguistics, where issues to do with myth and mythology are well understood. Maybe we need to inspire someone to do a research on the myths and mythology around climate change. But for now, allow me to move on to the next speaker who is uh, Dr. Tekla Mutia who will be presenting on the nexus between climate change and uh, uh, loss of uh, biodiversity and so on and so forth, loss of natural resources. And as she uh, proceeds with that presentation, let me just keep on reminding you that if you have any question, put it in our Q and A feature, because immediately after uh, Dr. Mutia's uh, presentation, we are going to have the first session of uh, responding to the questions. Asante sana. Welcome, Dr. Tekla. Thank you so much. Um, good evening, uh, colleagues, students, and uh, all the guests on board. My name is Tekla Mutia. I'm environment and natural resource scientist. I'm an alumni of Igaton University. I'm happy to see one of my professors here, Professor Oboyere, who taught me and uh, yeah, I'm one of his products on environment and natural resource management. I work as a senior environmental scientist for the Geothermal Development Company of Kenya that uh, is hosted in Nakuru. And the work of Geothermal Development Company, as you may all know, is exploration and development of geothermal resources in Kenya. So far, we have done some work in Olkaria where we have some wells that are feeding into the national grid for electricity. We have uh, proven steam existence to wellhead at Menengai, where we have several wells that are awaiting uh, dispatch to the grid for power generation. And now we are working in Baringo Silali area where we are doing exploration uh, geothermal wells on the same. At GDC, I am the head of research and innovation, and I'm glad to meet uh, my colleague here, Professor Bebe, whom I look forward to further engagements on matters research in this uh, topic. I've also had the privilege of working with the United Nations Food Agriculture Organization as the national environment protection expert uh, in combating desert locust. I had a uh, Kyoko mentioning that and it got me excited. I'm happy to be on this platform to share my experience, especially on matters of uh, geoscience when it comes to the rising uh, Rift Valley uh, lake waters. So now um, I want to share my screen. I had pre prepared a talk on this. It doesn't show slide show on my end, but does it show your end? Yeah. Okay, so I'll talk about the relationship between climate change and natural resource degradation with a specific focus on the rising lakes phenomenon. So I'll try to keep this very, very simple. And uh, to introduce really the rising levels of the lakes in Kenya, I, I will not say Rift Valley lakes alone because this has also affected areas in Trukana. It's about 12 lakes that have been affected in Kenya. And uh, most of them are actually within uh, the rift, as I would say, is a subject of interest to us geoscientists and also environmentalists and the media like you, because you communicate this message to the community on what is happening. And um, this uh, lake level increasing phenomena has affected all the prominent lakes within the Kenya tertiary rift, Lake Nakuru, Baringo, and also Lake Victoria in the Nyanzian rift. And of course the implication has been on businesses, economy, physical and habitat environments because of the shoreline flooding, erosion and geological changes. So here I have a picture 
uh, to show one of uh, the, the lodges in Baringo. It's the soy safari lodge that has been submerged since 2020 and therefore affecting businesses. So as Professor Gilbert has said, it's an interplay of factors from climate change to anthropogenic activities all the way to tectonic activities. And this trend has been witnessed since the year 2010 to 2013 and to 2019 as mild episodes of El Nino as reported by the Kenya Med uh, Department. And the impact really has been um, riparian land being submerged and people being displaced. So as I said, the causes top notch as everyone is talking about is climate change. And with climate change, essentially it's the water cycle balances, mostly precipitation, evaporation, and of course what is happening down there, you know. So the increased moisture availability has been seen by discharge of rivers feeding into the lakes and increased um, runoff occasioned by land use changes, which have increased silt into the lakes. And uh, this is experienced by the sedimentation and sediment uh, load that has been experienced as shoreline flooding, as I said, erosion and geologic uh, changes. I want to talk about um, human induced aspects here. Now, because of the increasing population pressure, most of these areas have been affected in a manner uh, that, uh, for example, there has been deforestation. And you know, uh, trees are important. Once there's deforestation, there'll be limitation in terms of water infiltration. So because of deforestation in these areas, there has been increase in runoff and this runoff carries with it silt. So this silt is deposited into the lakes. And as it's deposited into the lakes, it's able to close up some of the faults that are formed under because these lakes occur within the Rift Valley area. Within the Rift Valley area beneath, there's some structures. And these structures is what I'm going to talk about next being the tectonic activity. Tectonics is essentially you know, uh, when the crust is deforming and the plates are reorganizing themselves and there's a resultant uh, near and fast stresses. So what is happening at the moment from a geologic perspective or a geophysical perspective is what the scientists are saying is compressional forces. So because of this reorganization of the plates, the falls are closing. So as the falls are closing because of compressional force regimes, that means, and with also siltation, that means water is being held in a basin. And most of these uh, Rift Valley lakes are actually connected underground. Like Lake Naivasha will uh, discharge into Lake Magadi and so forth. So they have an underground connection. So because of that siltation and less water movement within the subterranean or underground channel, that means there'll be an overflow of water from the lakes. So that's how these three factors interplay and result really in uh, climate change being the main driver of, uh, of this uh, flooding causes and uh, rising lake levels. I don't talk much about the implications or the impacts. I know we have talked about it, but as you may all know, the Ministry of Environment is carrying out a study and this is uh, as a result of an alert that was brought about by the National Security Advisory Council to the Ministry of Environment to constitute a multi-agency technical team. And within this team, uh, we come in also as a geoscientist. There's also um, uh, other agencies like the UN who are funding this and a study has been ongoing. I'm pretty sure Egaton is also involved to understand really the hydrodynamics of what is happening to these lakes for creation of a strategy and better preparatory and planning methodologies for the future and within the counties. So from a report has been prepared, a scoping report, and the impacts have been documented real time. There's displacement of people in 13 counties where the effect has been reported. And you can see a number I've given there close to 80,000 households have been affected. And there's a plan to um, provide humanitarian assistance to almost 370,000 people who are affected. This has also impacted social amenities. Schools are affected. There have been water and sanitation challenges. 
health facilities were affected, fish, farming, and also uh, processing facilities were all affected. The impact is widespread, as you may all know by now. There's implications on livelihoods, disease outbreaks, security, and all other negative implications. There's a picture there showing uh, Baringo, a case of Baringo, and there's a village elder who is disappointed because this once used to be his farmland, but it's now submerged with hyacinth, weeds, and mesquite. So you see how that is affecting livelihoods. In this slide, I want to show you data that has been presented in that scoping report that I lifted. It shows 12 flags that were affected. You can see it runs all the way from Trukana, Baringo, Bogoria, Solai, Nakuru, Naivasha, Lake Victoria, and the Takwell Dam. You can see the changes since 2010, showing how the lakes have been swelling and the uh, percent statistics at the end. We can see that the highest change has been experienced in Lake Baringo, 68%. And you can see that the lowest change has been experienced in Lake Magadi. So you can see how this is really affecting us and we really need to understand what is going on to plan better so that we can be able to mitigate uh, what is going on. There are a few recommendations here, some are immediate, Others are long-term. We need to carry out flood control and catchment-wide conservation practices to reduce the impact of this flooding, especially on livelihoods and property in general. Of course, immediately we need to rehabilitate, relocate, and restore damaged infrastructure, as has been described before. Studies have to be done, especially on uh, hydrochemistry, and isotopic studies are good here to understand the interconnection between the lakes and also uh, the hydrodynamics that are going on for better preparation. Some isotopic studies like deuterium, oxygen can be used because here is a case of water flowing and also sediments. We need to also do some studies to understand land use, land cover changes, as well as water balance studies. This is important because we can be able to estimate the highest watermark in history. So that in case uh, we have such a repeat, then it's, this will be good in defining and demarcating the lake boundaries. There's also a proposal for the government to create a buffer zone by considering to buy the affected areas and also drilling of groundwater monitoring bubbles to try and understand um, the episodic recharges within the aquifers due to the heavy rainfall. Finally, the government should come in and support the development of strategies like the finalization and implementation of the National Lake Basin Management Structure Strategy. This is important because it will bring in key agencies for coordination action in terms of informing policies, developing plans, projects, and programs in management of such a scenario. And of course, prepare all the 47 counties in developing resilient, special plans on matters climate change in case of a future um, to manage such challenges in a more uh, predicate manner. Thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Kyoko. Thank you so, so, so much, uh, Tekla. Uh, I keep on uh, repeating that uh, for any question, kindly have it on the question and answer uh because uh, question and answer feature because we're actually headed to the first session of our question and answer session and uh, so far i see a question for every of our panelists kindly note that immediately after the first we will be moving on to the bit where i think the journalists might be more excited if the first uh, session was too scientific uh, because now we will get to uh, the point where James Fan and uh, uh, Beatrice, Bridget Ngana will be telling us on how to tell the climate change story. But even more, James Fan will tell us also about opportunities uh, we can get from Internews, at Jamzim Network, and also about COP26. Um, as you can see, he is uh, on the screen. He's just joined us. 
but I'm going to give him some time to just breathe in, breathe out, and know how the conversation is, is going on. Uh, and then immediately we go to the second session. Uh, we will have Bridget Ngana, and after that have James Fan, and thereafter we'll be concluding. All right. Uh, the first question is, uh, and actually, Professor Bokhlin Bebe has already indicated that he would like to respond to that. Is from Kimondo Maina, an undergraduate student here of communication and media at Egerton University. What are the main threats of climate change? Professor Bokhlin Bebe, you would like to respond to that? I can uh, respond to that. I'll respond this way. He's asking about which is the main threat. And I want to say all the all what we consider as uh, in climate induced threats, we can't say one is major than the other. It depends on the magnitude, it depends on where you are. Think of heat waves, think of cold waves, think of floods, think of drought. Which one would be easier for you? Which one will, 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 will you withstand? So all the threats, it depends on the magnitude. They grow to the level of crisis, depending on the magnitude, yes. So much, uh, Kimondo, I hope you got that right. We don't have that which is better than the other, okay? Or one which is worse than the other. All are worse, okay? That's why there are actually threats. Um, Melissa Aluot is asking, is there any strategy that has been put in place to curb siltation in Kenya currently? I think that question should go um, hand in hand with this other question that had been asked by Ogola Benedict earlier on, and Professor Gilbert Oboere, even if you had responded to Ogola's question, I request that you also respond to this for the sake of clarity to everyone. Is siltation a cause of rising water levels in the Rift Valley lakes, majorly caused by imbalance in water cycle or soil characteristics? Professor Oboere, you can take those two. Uh, thank you uh, for the two questions. Uh, the first one, I'll start with the last one. Uh, where siltation, uh, Ogola is asking whether siltation is caused by uh, or rising sea level, uh, lake levels are causing siltation, and uh, whether uh, the, this is a, a response or a response to soil characteristics. I think uh, I said very clearly that uh, the catchment, integrated catchment response looks at two issues. The first issue in the catchment response is hydroclimatic conditions. And the other one is the issues to do with, uh, with the, the, the people themselves. So first thing is that if there is a breakdown in the water balance, and water balance is a, a multifaceted uh, model which takes care of climatic conditions, soil characteristics, uh, the, the characteristics of the rain itself, this, the slope of the land, the cover of the land, and, and so on and so forth. So once when when we have a, a, a problem with the with the catchment itself, we are likely to have a breakdown in the water balance. So the water that is supposed to infiltrate will not infiltrate. The water that is supposed to evaporate will not evaporate, and all this water will find its way uh, in overland flow and end up in the water reservoir. So if there is a breakdown in the hydrologic function of the catchment, then we are likely to have uh, more water running into the, into the rivers and down into the lakes. And as it runs, it will carry with itself 
uh, soil particles that are detached in the erosion process. And this will end up in the, in the lakes. So what will happen is that we will rise the bed of the lake. The bed of the lake will rise. And what you see is more water, it's like there's more water in the lake. But actually, most of the volume of the basin has been taken up by silt. And that will cause uh, uh, a rise, an apparent rise in the lake. I think this was very evident in Lake Bogoria and Baringo at some point, until some interventions were made uh, before the current uh, phenomena uh, came, play, uh, came into play. Now, the first question was about a strategy on, uh, uh, maybe you can remind me what was that? The strategy was on about what? The strategy, yes, yes, yes. Is there any strategy that has been put in place to curb siltation in Kenya currently? Maybe um, if you like, you can respond to her. This is uh, a question from Melsa Aluoch. She is an undergraduate student of media and communication at our main campus. Uh, perhaps you can use this to talk about the different strategies we have, even and including the national determined contributions. Okay, uh, th thank you. Thank you that, for that question. First, there are very many strategies uh, that have been in place in Kenya for quite a long time. Uh, those who are my age and uh, lower, you can remember the soil conservation strategy that was spearheaded by Mulu Mutisia and the soil conservation um, uh, paradigm. And uh, currently, we are looking at uh, the catchment approach, watershed management approaches. There are some varied uh, set of uh, practices uh, in conservation agriculture and many others that can be used to curb siltation. I don't want us to go into the practices themselves and uh, do uh, soil and water management course here, but uh, several strategies are apparent. Some are working, some are not working, some respect our intervention, some don't. I can remember in the um, uh, late 80s, uh, the late President uh, Moy uh, built very nice gabions on the River Chemeron. And uh, a few hours later, it rained in the, in the mountains up there, and all of them were actually swept into Lake Baringo. The issue is they went to the tail end of the, the catchments to put gabions, but the water was coming from the Tugen Hills. So the catchment approach must be uh, enforced uh, scientifically, with scientific evidence and scientific results, so that we can be able to do a good job. On uh, climate change, there are also strategies. We have the Red Plus, the Red, uh, the Clean Development Mechanism, which uh, my student Tekla can talk about very well. I think they are, they are the champions in Kenya on Clean Development Mechanism. They just got an award the other day. And uh, there are several uh, approaches that we can use to mitigate climate change, at the same time making some money for our, our communities. Uh, thank you, Kyoko. Okay, um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Oboere. Uh, Dr. Tekla, there's a question here that uh, Nasimiu Matofari, one of my colleagues here at Asia Tune Radio has asked, and it's being co-asked by, um, by Cynthia Wangoi Gishiri on um, GDC. And the question is whether uh you know the work that gdc is doing yes does gdc contribute to the rising lakes i think it's the geothermal activity and the extraction of uh, geothermal uh, power is that a contribution to the rising river lakes and especially lake bogoria as the first question Thank you, uh, Kyoko and colleagues. Um, during drilling for geothermal steam, we drill for steam. Uh, we drill uh, between three to five kilometers below depth. When you are drilling for water, and this water is the one that we are talking about that recharges the lakes and all that, 
water is drilled at between 100 to 300 kilometers below, uh, below uh, depth. So not kilometers, sorry, um, meters. So what that means is that these two systems are not connected at all. And Mark, you, um, the leg started swelling up in 2010 and our activities started uh, last year in the Baringo Silali block. So no, these two systems are not connected. We drill for steam, that is super saturated steam at three kilometers below depth. And that is a different system. There are cases in the world where people drill actually inside water. And when the drilling is taking place, there is casing. So that means these two waters do not mix because the water that is coming from below sometimes carries with it heavy metals and other uh, radon components that if mixed with this normal uh, potable water could cause contamination. So the two systems are not connected at all and we drill for steam and not water. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just hold on there. Um, and uh, let's appreciate uh, our colleagues also joining from uh, Uganda, where Benon, our colleague, uh, is. From the last presentation, that's your presentation, Tekla, I think even the altitude in most cases can be a driver of climate change in the event of compression of the lying rocks adjacent to the lake, a case of Lake Albert on the western arm of the Rift Valley. This is uh, Robert from, uh, from Uganda. All right, kindly keep your questions uh, coming. Do you want to say something on that, uh, Dr. Dr. Mutia, before we move on to the next uh, session? Yeah, I agree with uh, Robert from um, Uganda. True, 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 uh, altitude is a, is a contributing factor as well, because uh, this is a scene this is, we are talking about rifting. So the low lying areas, the deeper areas actually are susceptible to effects, especially tectonic movements. This is because of the near and far forces that are happening below there and the fractures forming and so forth. So yeah, I will not dispute that. That is uh, very true, Robert. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. A question here from Winnie Kamau uh, about the myth and mythology. A colleague of ours here joining us from uh, Nairobi, if I'm not wrong. There is a myth that a long time ago, the lakes in the Rift Valley were all one huge lake family, but because of human interference and seismic uh, interference, they separated. But now the brothers and sisters are looking for each other. And soon, <laughs> There will be a re reunion at Lake Victoria. Is this true? Surely, uh, this is one of the best case studies of, of a myth eh? uh, and mythologies. Uh, are there mitigations against the emerging the, the merging of the fresh and salt water lakes? Uh, okay, partly because uh, we've had uh, and we don't know whether this is actually a myth or actually a fact that at some point these lakes could actually merge. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Professor Gilbert Oboyere to respond to that. And then the last response on questions will be from, will be by Professor, Gil, Professor Bebe, then we move on to the next session. Can Professor Bebe shed some light on what would be the role of innovation in combating climate change? And is what we have seen so far the tipping point or are we yet to see uh, worse than that. And uh, I see Peter Kishuki had asked uh, Professor Oboyere, you talked about sociological and scientific explanation to climate change. Where do we as journalists stand while reporting on such stories? Um, Professor Oboyere, I'm going to request you to hold, not to respond to Gishuki's question, not because it is not important, but because these are the issues that uh, Ngana and Fan will actually be responding to. So we'll handle it in the next session. Are there any records of history on the water levels in these lakes before the population, okay? Before the population increased in number. I have noticed in Kariandusi and around Lyons primary features of a cliff that in my imagination seem to suggest Nakuru, Naivasha and Elementaita could have been a sea or ocean before. 
Could it be that the waters are reclaiming their land? Am I overthinking? This is uh, Cynthia Gishiri. Um, same thought as Winnie Kamau has. Let's start with you, Professor Oboye. Uh, yes, Kyoko, I think uh, the, 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 the participant who asked that question on uh, whether the brothers are, uh, or the chicken are coming back home to roost or the brothers and sisters are reuniting, uh, it remains mythological. Uh, maybe from the bible also you you remember the what the earth was desolate and it was all water or something like that until uh, a command was made and separated water from land and, and so on those are also um, uh, religious or uh, theological explanations of uh, phenomena it's philosophical it is cultural and so on uh, I do not have any evidence that uh, these lakes were one. Uh, I'm not sure whether they were, but uh, as we said, many things are changing. Yeah, the, the the tectonics are playing their role. We don't know what is going to happen next. If they, it happens such that uh, Africa is split the way we are being told, it might split into two. We don't know whether there will be another lake from uh, another river from uh, the Mediterranean all the way to the Pacific. We don't know. So it is likely uh, that the things we are looking at in modeling and uh, environmental modeling are pointing towards severe environmental catastrophes if we do not arrest the current uh, patterns. And we are likely to see uh, more uh of uh unusual things that we have not seen yeah we are talking about uh, melting of ice or uh, snow or whatever it is in the arctic and in the antarctic what will happen to that water that is coming down it will come to our oceans the sea will rise as it rises uh, i don't know what will happen to earth river as it enters uh, uh the ocean in, in uh, Sabaki. We don't know how far the estuary will come. We don't know whether it will be in the Mulolongo. We are not sure. So the best thing is let's try and uh, take seriously the measures we are having, like what is going to happen in COP26, that uh, uh, thinking of uh, reducing our activities that are likely to be ahead the chances of accelerating the problems of climate change. And uh, for the last question on, uh, on uh, whether we have uh, 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 the lakes reclaiming their basins, that could be true. Because uh, I remember when, uh, when I was a young, a young boy or a young man, there were rivers that we could not cross. But these days we just walk across. So if things change and the rivers reclaim their all their uh, drainage basins and their channels, we are likely to see bigger rivers. And therefore we are likely to see the lakes as they were if things don't change. I think that's what I want to say on that. On that. But uh, most okay. of it is mythological. Mm. All right, thank you so much. I think we also need to appreciate that legend has it that uh, Lake Victoria is actually as a product of the urine of an ogre. That is what legend has it. And that's why it's actually called Lake Nam Lolwe. Okay, Lake Victoria among whoever said they discovered it, but among the residents, it's called Nam Lolwe. <laughs> Professor Boklin Bebe, Karibu. That's interesting. Eh? <laughs> uh, the question is uh, the role of innovation. But he's saying in stopping climate change, you need to know that innovation is about everything that will bring that knowledge and science into use. So if you're talking about mitigation, if you're talking about adaptation, 
how we'll use it, how we'll apply it, how effective it will be, it's a matter of innovation. So innovation is everything of addressing that science, that knowledge into use. It is, it is what will uh, help us uh, get into this. He's asking if uh, we have not seen the, the worst yet. That's what uh, Gilbert has just elaborated. And I could further emphasize on this COP26. Remember all the, all the world leaders are being mobilized to agree to do all that's possible to maintain or to limit further temperature increase, global temperature increase to 1.5. This is because the projections, model projections are showing if temperature rise will go towards two or even above, we will be in a crisis. It will be a threat to life that most of the living organisms may break in their metabolic systems. Eh? So that's what the model projections are showing. So that's why the, all this COP26 is aiming at bringing or can, uh, not affording to increase so that we can have zero uh, net uh, carbon uh, goal. Uh, as to whether I will stop it is another issue, but reversing it or I mean, uh, minimizing the acceleration, yes, for sure we will. If we do, all those that science has now proven that has effect, uh, simple, some of them are simple, actually. Afforestation should be simple. But some countries have made very serious commitments. Uh, the developed countries, some are now promising to move from fossil energy-driven machines. Eh? Very soon there will be no, for them, production lines for petrol and diesel cars or engines. Eh? They're going electric. Maybe atomic will uh, come in uh, uh, as a way of uh, curtailing further emissions uh, into the at uh, atmosphere. So innovations has everything. All that information that will work, all that science that will work, is innovation that will make it be effectively applied. Okay. Um, thank you so much for that response. And I hope uh, Daniel Kipchumba, you also understand that when we are talking about innovations, we are not talking just about innovating robots. Uh, even coming up with food varieties to deal with the climate change is also innovation in it. And at Tijaton University, we are at the forefront of doing that. Kindly keep your questions coming uh, through our Q&A feature. Hannah Wanderi, I have seen your question. Have we had heat waves and cold waves this year in Kenya? Are we able to track these waves? I see Babina Chepkrui has um, tried to respond to your question a bit. Uh, huh. Then uh, Caroline Chebet, might there be an instance in future that these lakes might one day turn into balls of dust in instances of reorganization of tectonic plates? All right. Dickens Omolo, what do climatic models say about warming that could happen in the coming decades? Hilary Chakava, there have been suggestions in Kenya to build a strong wall between Lake Bogoria and Lake Baringo to prevent the alkaline and freshwater lakes respectively from merging. How practical is this, Professor Oboere? Let's see whether we can get some time in the next session of Q&A uh, to respond to some of these questions. Because for now, I would like us to move to the next uh, bit of presentations. We were to stop at 5.30. We are already five minutes past that. Uh, so we need to be a little bit uh, careful before uh we spend more time than had been you know planned bridget singana how do we tell the climate change story you've done this before kindly share some tactics you're muted you're muted kindly kindly unmute 
So thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry for that technical hitch. And just as you've said, I'm a journalist and I'm glad that my colleagues here in the Rift Valley, I'd like to salute all of you who have taken part in this webinar. It's very, very important. Um, just a brief background on who I am. I am Bridget Ngana, a journalist who works with the Nation Media Group, NTV Television. I have been working here in the Rift Valley for the last seven years, and I have deep passion for the environment and climate change is one of those topics that really is close to my heart. And what I can say is, as journalists, we are observers mostly. We see these things happen or we are recorders of history. And this is something that is happening at a very special time. Uh, we're living in very unique times. And the reality of climate change for Africa is what we are seeing right now. I would like to appreciate what the other speakers have mentioned ahead of me, the scientists, the people who know the meat behind the matter and us, our work is just to diffuse that for the public to consume. And the creation of awareness has been there. It, we could do more with the right empowerment in terms of information and capacity building. And so just to go ahead into asking, how do you cover the climate change story? And I think for me, as a journalist, where I stand or where I speak from is from the point of view of the human cost of climate change because it affects lives. And we've seen the different professors giving their, I can maybe talk about Professor Bebe who said, it has an impact, it affects everything. And just because we're in the global south, as much as we are, may not understand what is happening, but I believe for those who are here, we have noticed that every drought in Kenya, for example, used to be a five-year cycle, seven-year cycle. Now, every year, we're talking about drought. At such a time as we're speaking right now, some pastoralists in Kajiado today had to sell their livestock at a throwaway price. The government is taking up their livestock because they are dying. Again, a month ago in Laikipia, we did see conflict, conflict instigated by changes in weather patterns. Now, some ways of life that had been very cultural and very natural for us are becoming um, impossible, near impossible. How do you tell a pastoralist to start agriculture at such a time as much as we talk about climate sensitive agriculture? This is somebody who's grown up knowing that his way of life is the flock and the flock is how he gets his daily bread. Now, telling them to not go out and graze. Now we are seeing all this play out. And so from where I sit, that is how we've been covering this story. On the issue of the rising lakes, we have seen since 2010, the changes in Lake Nakuru, which is close by to where we are right now. I'm in Nakuru. And now I've also got an opportunity to also cover Lake Baringo and Lake uh, Naivasha, all the way to Lake Solai. Lake Solai is unique in the sense that when it just started out as a spring, but right now we have more than 120% increase in water levels. And ideally, the county government has introduced fish. I remember um, as we are covering this story in terms of the displacement and in terms of the crisis that it is also bringing out, we could case in point is Baringo. Baringo is the best um, testament for anyone who wants to start reporting on this rising lake phenomenon to go to and see because that is where you have a true testament of how this phenomenon is affecting lives. 12 schools have been closed, thousands of people have been displaced. There were three lakes um, in Baringo that we were looking at, Lake 94, Lake Baringo, and Lake Bogoria. As we speak, Lake 94 has merged with Lake um, Baringo, Lake Bogoria, I understand, according to um, an expert who sat at the task force by the government, and I think Dr. Tekla is, is part of that task force. Um, he mentioned to me just prior before I came on, and he was like, you know, ideally, when the KWS is drilling sections of Lake Bogoria, as we speak, it has merged with Lake Baringo. And this, according to the UNDP that has been funding this task force report, is um, spelling doom or so, or when they emerge, there's that crisis now. And so where we as journalists, I think our idea situation is to keep account and a true account for that matter of how this phenomenon is affecting livelihoods and what governments need to do to avert or alleviate the crisis. Here in Nakuru, thousands of people have been displaced by Lakes Nakuru and Lake Naivasha. And we have also done that, we've done stories to that end. The uniqueness is that as much as the water levels have risen in these lakes, there's also the positive side. For example, we are seeing fishing activities in Lake Solai. That is something that had never been there. I, I, I spoke with some of the people who've been there 
for the last 50 years um, who've lived through and seen the transition of that Lake Solai, for example, from the spring that it was, because that place was a grazing land, but now fish and they, there's an issue of tourism now, the county government of Nakuru is looking at maybe um, marketing Lake Solai as another tourist attraction site, but we're also seeing the water creeping in. So as much as um, science also has given us evidence for us as journalists is just to digest that and try to make sense of all this for the public, because they are the people who are affected. They are the people that we are doing their stories on. And again, also keeping those in power accountable. I believe personally right now in Kenya, as we're also going towards the election period, we should also talk about the issue of climate change and climate sensitivity, not just from the point of view of the policy level and um, with all due respect, but also for the from the public level. Because right now, if we go to the area of Mao, I cover the Mao forest and I remember the government had been passionate about protecting this vital water tower that has also been decimated. The Mao forest plays a very key role in terms of managing the climatic conditions here in the greater East African region. So when part of it is the and now we're seeing all this, um, the, run, the water cycle being interfered with. Um, the, scientists, the scientists in this panel can, can correct me, but we are all seeing that coming into play. And from where I sit is that as journalists, the challenge that we are having in moving this climate change story forward and talking about it also are two things. One, we lack access to the information. I'm so glad today I am able to sit in such a panel. And I know after this, I'll be asking Professor Brocklin, uh, Dr. Tekla, and Professor Oboyere for their contacts, because I now know that in case I need to cross-check my facts as I cover this story going forward, they'll be able to pinpoint really I need to change my focus on but I'd really encourage those who are here to keep talking about this story it's not going to go away anytime soon we're going to see more developments because this is something that is transforming earlier on I also got to share some of the work that I've done um, for the students who are here you could um, there are links that will be posted by um, uh, I, I shared it with the Kyodo, Kyodo. Yeah, so Kyodo. he has two sto yeah, Kyodo, stories that I have, I have covered on this. One of them is on the giraffe relocation. And you see, when we talk about climate change affecting every aspect, we're talking about tourism, we're talking about livelihoods, we're talking about school, we're talking about the psychosocial impact. So this is something that we cannot just close our eyes to and say, no, it's not there. It is there. When the Global North talks about capping those rising temperatures, we are living the reality of that 1% rise in temperature. So this is the reality now we are living in. So it's our responsibility to keep talking about it. As much as newsrooms right now also fighting for that space for the, for the um, not so sexy stories. And I think the journalists here would understand what I mean. Not so sexy stories. I know we're going to the political period. So politics is going to be very hot and dictates a big chunk of the running order. But you need to still talk about these stories. And one of them, as I mentioned, was on the relocation of the Rothschild giraffe. As an environmental journalist, you know that we deal with a wide and breadth of, of issues. And this is something that is wide. We cannot even use this time to talk about it. But just to point you in that direction, the rising lake phenomenon in Lake Bogoria, Lake Bogoria, no, Lake Baringo, yes, the freshwater one. So the, um, the, the enveloping or the flooding of the Ruko Conservancy, this was a, um, a, a conservation area for this Baringo giraffe, the Rothschild giraffe is an endangered species. And so they were trying to reintroduce them back into that environment. Unfortunately, now they have to move them to the land that is adjacent. Now we are not sure that maybe they're going to also have to push them further. Habitat loss has affected them. Now the rising lake phenomenon is also affecting, affecting them. So they had to be relocated. And I was there when they did the first test run. And that link will be shared with you to just see how the dynamics behind this and how it goes into just the people who've put their lives out there to just ensure that they try to respond to this. Now, from where I sit also, there's the issue of the government involvement. I can say that 
um, right now, since this phenomenon came into play, or since we started seeing this rise, the rise in water levels from Lake Turkana all the way to the disappearing Lake Magadi, rather that's the irony, Lake Magadi is disappearing, other lakes are gating water, but now Lake Magadi is now almost disappearing. So when you look at that scenario, um, the government seems to have been caught flat-footed, and I don't understand why. Um, the report is out on the task force that really sat through to understand this. And I'm so glad Professor Oboyere and Dr. Tekla and Professor Bebe have been able to kind of break it down for us to understand this up the possible reasons as to why this, we're having this phenomenon. And these are the measures that need to be taken. And we understand that it is heavy, uh, resource intensive. Um, yesterday, um, the PS for environment was talking about the cost that we are going to take to mitigate on the effect of climate change. Remember, Africa is the least contributor of um, the rising global temperatures, but we bear the biggest brand. We are the biggest um, um, victims of this phenomenon and, and the climate change in, in, in essence. And so when you look at now the money that is going into helping um, communities right now, 12 schools have been closed in Baringo. We are thinking that things are back to normal, but in that part of that kind of our country, children are not going back to school. Why? Because there are no classrooms. Their classrooms have been submerged, and the government is just had just given them a makeshift shelter for them to go back to school. So we keep talking about this, and um, Kyoko, I think. Uh, Maybe I would not want to just run. I can rant on and on and on, but let me just refer to my notes. Let me refer yes. to my notes. And if I go off course, just please tell me. So again, we have a problem also when it comes to accessing these experts. You know, the red tape, we need to deconstruct that. We need to break it down. We need to create um, um, a, a situation where we have mutual and confidentiality and, and trustworthy relationship. I usually have a problem when I'm doing these stories, when I want to quote maybe um, the Dr. Stella Aura, the Director General of the Kenya Meteorological Department, and she'll refer me to maybe um, the Ministry of Environment that the PS has to give her the clearance to speak. So you see, those are the things that the challenges that we are facing, but I'd like to encourage us all to just keep telling these stories. It is important that we continue to talk about it. It is important that it should make sense it is important that it even features, I would vote for a presidential candidate, and I'm sorry if I sound political, but I would vote for the presidential candidate who really talks about how we're going to help our communities deal with climate change. As a, a Rift Valley regional journalist, I have seen how this climate change, even not just the rising lake phenomenon, how climate change is affecting livelihoods. It is bad. I was in like Kipia and I, I've never come close to hearing gunfire, but I did get to see that. And you see, when the government brandishes um, a community that relies on pastoralism as a way of life, as bandits, as what, you know, and on this end, we also have the clash of farmers and stuff like that. It really puts you as a journalist in a very compromising situation. And it really is confusing because you're seeing that everyone is fighting to survive. And so if we don't deal with climate change, let's be ready to deal with conflict. If we don't deal with climate change, if we don't address the issues that we need to, to talk to and be keep those people accountable, then I think at the end of the day, we'll be shooting ourselves in the foot. And Kyoko, maybe as I wind up, um, what we have seen as journalists also is the oxymoron again. When we're the rising water levels has given rise to human wildlife conflict. Right now in Baringo, I believe the local hospitals are reporting cases of children and everyone being mauled by crocodiles and hippos. And that's the other side effect. Here at Lake Naku National Park, we've also seen the rise in fishing. And according to scientists, they say maybe um, when the lakes were rising or the rivers, the inflow, the discharge was coming into the lake, maybe it went through a dam. And that's why we have fish in a saltwater lake. And this has given rise to piracy or um, poaching of fish in this national lake, but now the government is trying to deal with that also on its end. And I think um, as journalists, it's um, from, from, I am so passionate about this. <laughs> and I, I believe we just, need to keep telling these stories we just need to keep going on and on about it and never getting tired and holding people accountable and and as much as our government seems to try let's also put them 
to account. I'm open for questions and I believe you can see the links that Kyodo has posted there. Go to the stories. I'd be, I'm available on my social media platforms on Twitter and on Instagram for questions as we go on. And to the journalist students, keep following your passion. Environment is something that is important because our environment is everything. Um, I, I admire the work done by Mogari Madai and the, the other people, the present day um, environmentalists. And I am so, so glad to be part of this panel. And um, I would really love to hear from everyone else. And if you have questions, please shoot. But it is important that we keep talking about it. It is important that we keep sharing our stories because we are the scribes and we are the people who are documenting history as it unfolds brilliant times we're living in peculiar times but it is our time also as journalists especially from africa to really raise our voices in the right. space of climate conversations and in the rising in the in this time also when we're living in terms of the rising lake phenomenon so i'm open to questions and thank you so much for having me okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Bridget and Ghana. Your presentation at some points almost sounding like a PTC. Uh, journalists understand better when I <laughs> say what a PTC is. Okay. Um, I actually saw um, the name of Elizabeth Merab, one of uh, uh, senior journalists in this country, pop up somewhere. Yes, she was asking about contacts uh, of the experts. We, uh, we are having a chat with, uh, with uh, Kyundo on that. And actually at this point, allow me to actually ask all the experts and bring this to their attention, that journalists are actually asking for your contacts. Kindly uh, communicate on the chat on your, on your uh, appreciation that we share your contacts. Uh, if it is okay that we share your contact. We just need you to uh, to bring that to your attention and give a nod. Yes. And then um, at this point, then allow me to invite uh, James Fan to give his presentation. James, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Kyoto, uh, Kyoto for uh, this. Uh, for inviting me to talk. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I enjoyed listening to the presentations. And uh, I realize it seems like I know we're over time. Um, and so I, I will try to keep my remarks brief. So I am the director of Ancient News Earth Journalism Network. Uh, we've been working with Kyundu over the last few years on our East Africa wildlife journalism project and now we're so excited also to be able to add climate change topics to uh, this project and uh, to be able to host this webinar. Um, please keep a lookout. I, I know, uh, I think it might, it'll be next year, but I think we're going to have story grants available for journalists to uh, produce stories on climate topics in East Africa and I'm sure we'll have more webinars and so on. So it's great to be a part of this and this um, and I, I will just say, you know, that you as journalists covering climate change, you really have a chance to cover what will essentially be the biggest story of this century. You know, this is going to affect more people in more ways than just about anything else, uh, even COVID. Uh, so, you know, it's a great opportunity for you to, you know, learn more about this topic, to report more on this topic and, you know, uh, to really can really make a difference, uh, both to the to helping the public understand this important and, and uh, impactful issue and also to your own careers to help you, um, you know, uh, advance in your in your professional life. But I know we, it's already very late. And um, the uh, so I will just say, I uh, want to talk briefly about what's coming up at COP26, because every year uh, we at the Earth Journalism Network, we have this climate change media partnership. We've been bringing journalists such as yourselves to the climate cops uh, for the last 15 years, essentially, since 2007. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to a climate summit, um, the UN climate summits are usually held in November, December of each year, you should definitely 
go if you can. It's a wonderful opportunity. Not only do you have a great chance to, to produce stories for your media outlet, stories that will be prominently displayed on the front page or the lead of broadcast, uh, but it's just an amazing experience. And it's kind of like a, a, it's like an immersion course. You get to learn everything and anything about climate change. There's so many interesting side events and not to mention you're covering negotiations that are gonna affect our planet and future generations. Um, so if you get a chance to go to these conferences, you should try, it's not easy, obviously. That's why we offer these fellowships each year. Uh, we are bringing this year uh, one Kenyan journalist, Daniel Kaburu from K24 TV, as well as a Ugandan journalist, Fred Mugira from Water Journalists for Africa. So, you know, you will probably, uh, you know, um, well, let me say, for since most of you will not be able to attend, I assume uh, you should try and cover the conference remotely. There'll be a lot of information coming out from Glasgow. Uh, and that includes information from us, from the Earth Journalism Network. Uh, we, you should check out our website, www.earthjournalism.net. Uh, beginning, I think next week, we're gonna have a new page up called Live from COP26. So it's not ready yet, but take a look next week. We can send a reminder around. Um, and uh, we're gonna have lots of resources on there for ways that you can learn more about climate change and how to cover it, learn more about the COP and what's going on there. It's gonna be updated continuously this page. You're gonna have recordings of podcasts and panel discussions. Um, and I think most exciting of all, we are gonna have a daily broadcast from the UK from Glasgow, uh, beginning on November 8th. That's the Monday of the second week. So the second week is when a lot of the news comes out and uh, there'll be a, a broadcast every day at noon UK time, which I believe will be about 2 p.m. in Kenya. Um, so you can log in, you can log into that broadcast. You can ask questions. Maybe I we'd like to be able to help you to get information from the COP. So if you wanna, you know, try and ask, you know, you need help getting information from a Kenyan delegate or something, uh, or, you know, just want information about, or find, find a contact, maybe we can help you. I can't promise to help everyone, but that's our goal is to help you do, be able to cover the climate summit from a distance. Um, so check that out and just, one final thing, because I see we're almost at the hour. Um, but I, uh, I next year, the next climate summit, COP27, is going to be in Africa. And I actually think it's going to be in Egypt. That's what I've heard. I don't think that's official yet. Um, but we've heard that the next climate summit probably is going to be in Egypt. And uh, that's not so far from Kenya. So uh, certainly, uh, if you want to go to the next Climate Summit COP27, you should apply. I hope we will be able to offer fellowships. I mean, it's a year away, so it's hard to know. But hopefully next year we'll be, offer, be able to offer fellowships to go there. But even apart from that, it's very competitive to get these fellowships. You know, Kenya is not so far away from Egypt, so or, or wherever it'll be in Africa, you should, uh, you know, try and find a way to get there, you know, ask your media outlet, they can support your travel, find there'll be other means of support, I'm sure. So, uh, you know, just a, just a final word to say, thank you again for all your work on covering climate change and other environmental topics. It's so important what you're doing. And if we at the Earth Journalism Network can help you in any way, please just give us a shout. Thank you. Thank you so much. There you have it. Cynthia Wangoi, you were asking me about the opportunities at the end of the webinar. That's one of the opportunities and I hope you've really gotten it, that the COP27 might be held in Africa, that's Egypt. And if we start planning for it now, who knows? We could be there as a delegation from Kenya and actually as a delegation from this webinar. Yeah, if yeah. We start, yes, if we start planning now. And um, well, um, Kyundo, I would like you to briefly talk about some of these opportunities now deeper. I know there are some journalists who have interacted with the internews and other uh, 
uh, organizations that give grants. Eh? But we also have some young ones who are joining us for the first time kindly. Uh, if you could sh just share with them about how we usually go about it, getting grants and so on and so forth, and especially from interviews. Uh, thank you so much, Kyoko Wakivandi, for steering that in a wonderful conversation. I've learned a lot today you know, about climate change from all the speakers. You are all wonderful. And uh, Bridget Ghana, uh, you've made me miss to go back to the newsroom. I hope that is feasible in some future. <laughs> uh, yeah, so thank you, James. Uh, James is my boss at e Internews EJN. He has mentioned about uh, the climate change grants uh, that we have. and. Uh, at Internews, we always do a call uh, that we put up on our website at earthjournalism.net. Uh, uh, and this call, then we, you know, we share on our, you know, social media handles. So be kindly on the lookout uh, for that. Uh, so we calling out for the climate change uh, grants. Uh, we have about 10. Uh, it's always a very competitive process. Uh, a lot of people do apply and uh, we only have far to give about 10. Uh, so put your best foot forward. If you want to apply, uh, look for that in January and we'll give this out in March uh, after we review um, all the applications. And again, it's a very elaborate uh, process, very fair. A couple of judges, you know, like seven to 10, uh, we look at all the applications uh, with a fine tooth comb uh, so that we, we, we make sure uh, we give everyone. And uh, Kyoko, I know you're very passionate about the journalism students. We also very passionate, you know, that they're joining us here. And, and James, uh, I know you've had a said chat with this. We'll also encourage uh, the journalism students to uh, to apply uh, to, to these grants into a workshop so that we can involve uh, them early on uh, before they even leave uh, the university. I know they write uh, I know you, you have a blog, Kyoko, but I know there is a radio, you know, that they practice on. And we like to engage you from a young age uh, because uh, most of us, when we went to the newsrooms, uh, we, we didn't know how to specialize to, to write health environment. And you had to learn, you know, uh, on your own. That is if you're interested. And that's why it, it remains uh, that a few people are able to be interested in this kind of work. As Ghana said that uh, in politics, politics sells in the newsrooms and you see a lot of people gravitate towards that. Uh, besides the climate change uh, grant, uh, we have a workshop on One Health uh, that will look at the planet, the people, uh, animals at the nexus, you know, about that and, and looking at even the emergence of uh, uh, viral diseases, you know, uh, like COVID-19. Uh, so we'll be having this webinar that of March, uh, so, oh, uh, that week of November and uh, next month. Uh, so we'll invite all of you um, on these two and kindly also uh, keep checking our website uh, for these updates. And we'll have a climate change workshop uh, that will bring about 10 participants. Uh, it should be uh, in person, we're hoping, uh, if the COVID situation allows, and these will go down in January. Uh, again, we'll communicate uh, with you now that we've become our team. And remember uh, to register as a member uh, on the website. If you go to the EJN website, you'll see the process uh, so that you're able to receive uh, all this information as and when uh, we upload it. Uh, so this uh, workshop uh, will be uh, interesting. Uh, you can check uh, some people called at uh, the Climate uh, Collage. Uh, they've come up with like an artistic way of teaching climate change. Uh, they use uh, some, you know, colorful kind of um, uh, sticky notes uh, for you to understand climate change, you know, uh, from uh, from human activity uh, to the repercussions, uh, to mitigation, to how we can fight resilience. So, so you learn this fiscally. It's a very good way for you to learn so that you are able to communicate the same because as we know, uh, this is a very complex topic. Um, even for that one, uh, we yet to decide whether we'll do an open call or we decide on who to uh, to work directly with uh, because it's also very uh, we need somebody who is uh, have done this before somebody who has passion for these uh, so that they benefit here yeah, to the maximum thank you so much again all our panelists and kyoko uh, for leading these i will beg to stop there thank you so much
Okay, thank you yeah. so much, Kiundu Waweru. A mine of resources there, uh, and that's why we are actually we actually decided to have this webinar so that we can introduce not just have this discussion on climate change, but also introduce our colleagues to the a million um, opportunities that are there when one is reporting on specialized areas such as climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, we are running short of time. We need to bring this to an end. Kindly allow me to- please. One minute, yes. please. We had shared a link uh, for you to give us, for the participants to give us a feedback about the webinar. And I'm being told by a technical person that the link might not be working. Is that the case? Um, yes, yep. yes, they are, they are, they have been that response and uh, yeah. uh, uh, someone has also responded that we it will be corrected and it will be sent in the okay uh, yes subsequent emails. Yes, I, I think for the interest of time, let's see what the problem is and then we'll share with you and kindly uh, find time to fill that up for us. We'll share. Okay. Uh, we always do a resource email after this where we'll send all the pre presentations and the contacts of the speakers if they allow us to do that. Uh, okay. And the link uh, of this uh, webinar that we uploaded on our website in a few. So we'll share that email tonight, uh, plus now okay. the link. Thank so, you. So I'm, going to, I'm going to request all the panelists kindly to put their videos on so that we can sign out together. Um, as they do that, let me thank everyone who has uh, taken time to be with us. Professor uh, Boklin Bebe, DVC Research Egerton University, Professor Gilbert Oboyere, uh, scientist at Egerton University, Bridget Ngana, reporter at NTV, James Fan, Executive Director at EJN, Dr. Tekla Mutia of GDC, we are going to share contacts and all the information that we've had, including the links uh, with everyone. For those of us in Nakuru, uh, you can always get me, you know where to get me, okay? For those in Nairobi, I think you have contacts with the Kiundu Awero and Internews. You can always reach out to them for more information and for connections and linkages with these experts and many more. Please, let's bring this to an end by now, everyone just waving for our panelists, uh, just waving, okay, Tekla, hi. Okay, let's embrace our, you know, our mother earth. And if we do that, I think everything is gonna be all right. Thank you so much and bye-bye.